<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Digital Transitions. Thank you for joining us. My name is Doug Peterson. I am the head of R&D and product management at DT. Our company does a lot of different kinds of things, and uh, tonight we're going to talk about just one specifically of them, which is tech cameras. With us from Campbell USA headquarters is Blake. Blake said hello. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Blake will be co-presenting on me, uh, with me, and we're going to talk about tech cameras today. So I'm going to give you some logistics uh, at the end. <coughs> Beer in the back, tacos between you and there, bathrooms around the corner, you don't need permission, and questions will come at the end. If you have a question, like the thing that you're talking about right now is very confusing, feel free to interject, but we will have a dedicated Q&A. It's more of a tangential question. Please hold for the end. History. We're going to compress all the photographic history into like three slides in three minutes. Capabilities of technical cameras and why we use them. Terminology and definitions of words because there's nothing as exciting as defining words. Comparing different technical cameras. And then finally, accessories because we have some specific accessories we want to sell you, so we have to have a category called accessories. Next, we're going to talk about history. Next, this is. Camera Obscura. For 2,300 years or more, that's the earliest we have recorded information of, human beings have been punching holes through walls and seeing what comes out the other side. If the room or container, writ large, is light tight and has a hole in it, what is on the other side of that hole will be projected upside and backwards on the other opposite side. Next. Here, for example, a gentleman whose name I cannot promise you I can pronounce, so I'll let you read it for yourself. Here's a photography, a uh, photo of him capturing an image of an image projected by a camera obscura. It's kind of meta. It looks dark and nighttime-ish because whatever's on the inside of the camera is going to be much less bright than what's on the outside of the camera. So it looks dark, but actually it's bright daylight outside. Next. Once you have a room, rooms don't travel well, so maybe you want to portability it up a little bit, squeeze it down into a box, add maybe a viewing shade so you can see easily the dimmer image. Again, the thing on the inside is dimmer on the outside. And next, thank you. Next, we basically now take every single camera ever made from your iPhone to a rail, have you ever seen a railway camera, the one that's actually on the tracks, it's huge, that big? Every one of those is a light tight container with a hole in it, right? Sometimes the hole has glass, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes what's on the opposite side is a person painting a picture or drawing a picture. Sometimes what's on the other side is a uh, high-end phase one IQ4 100 megapixel sensor. Either way, box, hole, image projected. In a view camera, the back wall onto which that image projected is the rear standard. Standard here means a vertical holding thing. A standard bearer for a flag. Next. The front standard replaces the front of that box or the wall with the hole in it. So now you get the idea of the picture being projected. We can drop the picture so we don't have too much stuff on the screen and show you that we also need to connect these two together. We do that with a rail. Rail can be of various <coughs> length, can be collapsing, can be fancy, but you got to connect the two, otherwise, you're kind of trying to take a picture like this. That would Although I guarantee you, somewhere an MFA student has done that. Here we have a box with a digital back on the back. The digital back is now the thing recording the image projected through the hole onto the opposite wall. It's the thing taking the picture, right? And to make it light tight, we add some bellows. So a view camera, like every other camera you've ever used or ever will use, is a light tight box with a hole projecting the image on the opposite side. A view camera, has these specific components taking up those, uh, playing those roles. And, uh, so, 
if who please raise your hand have you ever used a view camera to take a picture fantastic just to make sure that people are paying attention please raise your hand if you've never taken a picture of the view camera right so totally okay if you last looked at a view camera in either the film era or the conversion from film to digital we are called digital transition as a company so we had some experience with that. The early years are what I refer to as the dark age of digital. Lots of cables, lots of extra steps to take the picture, lots of hassle and post-processing, very slow, very cumbersome. Honestly, it kind of made you wish you were just shooting film. And there's nothing wrong with film. You still want to shoot film. I'm not here to tell you. Just saying, it was really unpleasant. As we've moved through time and new generations of things, when digital backs have been released and new types of lens interfaces and new software have been released, we've really made it now very different. We are in what we would refer to as the golden age of digital photography for technical view field cameras. All the way up to <coughs> including a fully integrated aperture and shutter, all the way up to having zero cables, fluid live view that works like any other high-end camera you've worked with recently. You just push the button to take a picture. You don't have to wake up and then cock this and open that and re-cock this and close that and pull a dark slide. You want a picture, push the button, you get a picture. So a lot of improvements to workflow have been made, and we'll talk a little bit about those today, but we don't want to get super deep into the weeds. <clears throat> this is an illustration we have at phase one IQ, uh, phase1xt.com that illustrates the steps required for two specific combinations of equipment. These should not be considered definitive because there'll be exceptions and caveats and workarounds and redundancies and other things. So don't get too tied down in the weeds of exactly which steps go where. And certainly don't get tied down to the word camo here. This is a specific comparison to a specific <coughs> camera. The point is complicated, simple. We have gotten more and more simple across all brands of tech cameras, especially with the XT, but not limited to the new phase one XT. So, why do people use view cameras today? View cameras, tech cameras, field cameras. Please raise your hand if you're actively using view cameras today. Not, I used to do it 30 years ago. Right. Hopefully, I speak to the reasons you are doing it. If at the end of the capability section, you're like, yeah, but you didn't talk about this, tell me why you use a view camera. But here are some of the main reasons why people use these cameras. First, focus flexibility. With a view camera, especially a view camera, meaning the bellowed version of this, we'll talk about terms later, in a view camera, you have a lot of space to move the distance between the sensor and lens to be great. With an SLR design, nothing wrong with SLR, it's just a core difference here in approach. With a Canon Nikon Sony, the lens design itself has to incorporate the maximum amount of focus throw in the design of the lens, and it's a direct trade-off between weight, size, speed, and throw. You can't have infinite throw, the lens would weigh infinite. Right? On a view camera, you don't have to pay that penalty on the lens. You can design the lens to be very simple, and then the sensor moves away from the lens, in some cases, a great distance. What is the longest rail you have? Uh, 40, 450 millimeters, so about 18 inches, give or take. That's a long rail. That's, that's like yay long. This is that one, right? No. Actually, yeah. And that's the longest in current modern times. You can find view camera rails for even Next is shift. Displacing the sensor relative to the center of the lens, left or right. Technically, it's also shifting if you just move the lens and keep the sensor still, but for some really good reasons, we only sell brands of cameras where the lens stays fixed and the point of view of the camera stays fixed and the sensor moves behind it. That sensor moving left and right is very useful. It can also go up and down. Right? Up and down is called rise fall. <coughs> What do we use these for? Well, think about the camera obscura. There is a single continuous image being projected from what was on the one side of the hole to what's on the other side of the hole. That single continuous image, he has actually marked, he or she, it looks like he's wearing a cape. Is he wearing a cape? A cape, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very stylish. <laughs> he actually has drawn an outer border on the wall. But he's done so of his own accord because there's no natural rectangle in there. He could put the rectangle higher. 
and paint above the horizon, or lower and paint below the horizon, have the horizon a third of the way, or two thirds of the way, or entirely out of the frame if you wanted to. Same is true in a digital view camera, it's projecting a single continuous image. Typically, when we think about perspective or keystone and control, perspective control is technically a misnomer, but I'm not a pedant tonight, at least not with a beer. Perspective control is all about keeping verticals vertical and horizontals horizontal, or at least keeping them as vertical and as horizontal as you as the photographer wish. Here is a standard SLR lens pointed up, that is leaned back, the whole camera leaned back, and then turned a little bit so that I can stand right in front of this part of the carpet. I'm not standing in the middle of this frame, think about that. Standing to the front center of that carpet line so that I can see the edge of this class, I can see the edge of this class, and importantly, in this specific situation, so I'm not standing inside of a glass case containing the Gutenberg Bible, because they really frown at that. They do not let you stand inside of that case. So I have a place I can stand, but if I want the frame to include this rear wall, I have to turn the camera a little bit, right? What I end up with in this frame is verticals that aren't vertical, horizontals that aren't horizontal, an unbalanced, disorienting vibe to the image. If I am trying to make a movie poster for a drug movie, maybe that'd be a great idea. If I'm trying to create a sense of serenity, balance, organization, and structure, I probably don't. I can correct that, fix the <coughs> post, and I am not here to tell anyone what is the best choice for them and their needs and their client, but this method has two major costs. One is that things stretch out, right? The outside trapezoid represents the original canvas of the image, has been stretched to a trapezoid. Within that, we then have to draw a rectangle. Most clients don't like you to deliver trapezoidal images. <laughs> you crop into that image, which means you lose part of the frame and you're stretching pixels. So fixing it in post means you can't know what the composition is going to end up <coughs> as based on what it's starting as. Then it means you're losing pixels both to cropping and to stretching, right? If you take 10 pixels and stretch them out to be twice as long, you have half the resolution. Pixel number won't change, but the actual quality and, and clarity will. So instead, let's take a look at the single continuous image circle projected by, in this case, specifically a Rosenstock 40 HR lens with a full frame 645 sensor. You can change out that lens, you can change out that sensor. The point is, the blue is where the sensor is, and the circle is where the image is being projected. That's a terrible composition, do we all agree? Lots of floor. Nothing interesting at the corners, not balanced, not useful. I can, within that continuous, uninterrupted static image circle, move up, right? To get a more pleasing balance of <coughs> foreground and floor and subject. If I don't think I have enough ceiling, I can actually take another picture after that that's even higher up. Rise and capture again. Having captured those two images, I can stitch them together, and by stitching, we just need literally snapping them together because it's one image, right? And end up with a nice balanced composition. It is true, in this case, this is a square image. I could have I could have kept with a rectangle, I could have, I could have delivered a trapezoid. The point is I had the flexibility in camera to know where the corners were, to not stretch or compress pixels and to leave with the scene vertical and horizontal as I chose. Can I end up with this nice pretty picture? Which, look, you may hate or like, but you're not hiring me to do architectural photography. You're hiring me to talk to you for free while giving you beer about technical cameras. Next. Yes, please. <laughs> there are two other kinds of movements in view cameras, tech cameras, field cameras, that are a little less intuitive. They are swing and they are tilt. Here's swing, here's tilt. What do they do? In a standard camera, meaning any camera that doesn't have TS or tilt swing in its name or a view camera, the sensor plane, the orientation and uh, verticality of the sensor, and the orientation verticality of the lens plane are parallel. And you get what you have seen on any camera you've ever shot with, other than these, where the plane of focus defined by this line has some stuff in front, stuff behind that isn't focused, that obviously changes by aperture. What tilt allows you to do is not increase the size of that blue range, but to position it more usefully in alignment with your subject matter. And here we see with a little bit of tilt, 
on the lens, a little front tilt. We have leaned the focus plane significantly forward. Notice that the width in absolute terms from here to there has not changed. The same range of distance is in focus, but it is now closely aligned with our rock, our tree, our owl, and our mountain. Tilt allows you to extend the usefulness of your depth of field, in this case, in the landscape. Could you give me some scenarios other than landscape? What about you, Mr. Uh, shooting product photography, for example, uh, watches or small pieces of jewelry. Um, being able to shoot at much wider apertures and still be able to control where your depth of field lies within that plane. Think about a watch face. The totality of the height of the watch face. If you're a very small person on the surface of the watch face, the entire verticality, it's, it's not that tall, right? But it's very long. It's very hard to get an in-depth focus. It's very hard to get a focus image from front to back of a watch face that direction. But if you can lean the focus to be right in line with it, it's actually rather easy. I will now attempt to project more for our friends joining at Bowling. Thanks for joining. Thanks. It's very rare I'm told I'm too quiet. <laughs> you need to move for the front row, I'm okay. <laughs> Terminology, definitions of words, lots of fun. If we're being pedantic, if you look it up in a Photography 101 book, you will likely find that technical camera is the overarching term, an umbrella that covers view cameras, field cameras, and a couple other sub-varieties of technical cameras. However, if you Google it, if you go to an internet forum, if you ask 10 digital techs who are assisting this kind of camera, if you ask five people who own them, you will instead typically see tech cam, an abbreviated form of technical camera, meaning this style of camera that does not have bellows, and view camera, meaning the kind of camera that does have bellows. I don't care what you call things, but this is how we're going to talk about it for this presentation. No bellows, tech camera, bellows, view camera. The advantage of a tech camera is that without those bellows, those two standards, you can see them accomplishing the same movement, this thing right here, that, that's the second standard, that's the rear standard, but it's plate on plate. For this reason, we often call it a pancake camera. The two standards are pancaked together, they're flush, plate on plate movement. Even very, very high quality view cameras, their standards will bend toward each other very slightly as you place pressure, as you focus, manipulate, change lenses. Cambo makes excellent, extremely <coughs> rigid, very precise view cameras, but view cameras by definition from any camera company are supported for the base and project upward, so there's a lot of leverage for you to just tweak it a little bit at the top. That tech camera right here, you ain't gonna get those out of alignment, not even a little bit, not even if you try real, real hard. Why and how is this possible? Okay, promised myself I wouldn't do this, but we're gonna talk about normal lens lengths and film diagonals. Eight by 10 view camera, this big. Film diagonal, this long. Standard length lens should focus this far away from the film. Film, sensor normal length lens. If you have a pancake design, even a normal length lens, let alone a long one, would have to project out this far. With a medium format size sensor, even the full frame 645 sensor that phase one uses, you're looking at about yay diagonal. With that yay of a diagonal, a wide angle lens needs to be about yay far away from the sensor. For you two, we're talking about, you know, three knuckles worth. That level of depth very easy to accommodate on a tech camera. So in short, a tech camera is made possible by the fact that we don't need to move the lens as far from the sensor because we're using a smaller sensor than we did in the film era, and we are using wider angle lenses as the main use of a tech camera. Now, I am all about using cameras outside of their total comfort zone. There is a Rodenstock 138 HR that you can put on here. <laughs> that you can put on here. It is, quite frankly, the upper realm of what I think is practical with a tech camera, but you can do it. You can technically go longer than this. There's a Rodenstock 180. Yep. But these are cameras whose comfort zone is wide, super wide, normal, and slightly long, right? Whereas this has the flexibility with a 
four foot rail to shoot a 3,000 millimeter lens if you wanted to, right? So we can smush them together now that we're doing the smaller sensors if we're using primarily normal and wide lenses. So what the heck is field camera then? Phase one launched this new camera called the Phase one XT and they called it the world's first modern field camera. Well, field camera as a marketing term, let's be clear, this is all marketing, right? This is what you want to call your camera. This field camera is in fact, uh, I lost my train of thought because I got so enamored by the phase one XT coming over. It's um, the use of the word field camera basically fell off the charts a few decades ago. I wasn't around for it, so I couldn't tell you firsthand, but I know field camera was definitely a term used in the press film <coughs> 4 by 5 days. It was definitely a uh, term used to my professors when I was in college. But it's not a term I have seen on a single brochure or on a single website in 20 years. But field camera historically always meant view camera or technical camera with movements designed with portability in mind, right? Now designed with portability in mind sounds very good and, and friendly, and that's true. It of course comes with compromises. You can't design something for something without giving up something else. That's really the definition of what makes cameras like this amazing. If you want what they're designed for, they're the very best thing you could possibly buy for it. If you want something that does a little bit of everything, you're barking up the wrong tree, right? This is not gonna be a great uh, long lens bird camera. Actually, a pretty terrible one. Okay, so that is field camera. Phase one using the word field camera basically means tech camera, designed specifically for the field, and they didn't like the word tech because it sounds cumbersome and complicated and technical. You can love them or hate them for changing up the word tech camera to field camera, but that's basically the name I gave. Now, let's start comparing. This is where we get to use Blake because Blake, Camera USA, is going to play his part to say what he thinks this camera should do especially well and where other cameras might be the right choice. So, first of all, all three of these are great cameras. Great service and support. We don't, as a company, Digital Transitions does not sell any camera or any component that we don't believe that if we have a problem, we can't get that problem resolved, right? There are a couple other brands of this. We believe most strongly in these three brands. Great service support, great build quality, very, very precise manufacturing. The dirty little secret of this industry is that everybody uses the same kind of ultra-modern CNC machines. So anybody marketing themselves and manufacturing with extra precision, what are they adding extra zero at the end of their 16-bit float on their CNC machine? I don't know. Like, they're all incredibly precisely made. Don't take my word for it. Pick the darn thing up, it feels like it's made as well as this. They also all allow the use of Canon and Hasi 500 lenses in addition to their mainstay, which is gonna be your room stock large format lenses. There are absolutely reasons you might wanna use the Canon. A great example is the Canon 17 millimeter. Focal length is focal length is focal length. A Canon 17 on a full frame 645 sensor that's twice as big as a small format sensor is not wide, it's crazy wide, right? And covers the sensor. You also have a lot of movement, but no, you, 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 you can meet the widest. You've oh, the widest <clears throat> yes. the corner. Not great. Not as bad as you might expect, but I like to say it's really hard to complain about a lens that has no peer. Right? If you want to go that wide, that's the only game in town. So are the lenses at the corner is perfect? Are they like a Rome stock 20 frame corner? They are not. We have some sample files if you'd like to do some comparisons. So a lot of similarities, but they all have some unique pros and cons. Not because these companies are better or worse at engineering, but because they are choosing to make their compromises and their goals and their prioritizations different. Arca Swiss, for example. This one down, I'll give this one to you. Arca Swiss, it's a very lovely tech camera. They've been doing it for 60, 70 years, something like that. Four hours of work, sure. Arca Swiss, Arca Swiss built in a tilt mechanism into the chassis of the body itself. That means every single lens that you can put on this thing tilts. It means you don't have to pay for the tilt mechanism to be in the lens. It means that it's just there. Really, really a great pro. They also chose to make their own helical and build the helical into the body rather than the lens. So again, the lens, you don't pay for the helical again. And their helical is much wider and engineering terms, a wider circle makes it easier to be precise. 
the fine grainedness of this helical is, if anything, markedly too fine. Right? You will never find any use case, and I mean any use case, and I mean that in a very pedantic, deep sense, where this is not fine enough for the movement you wish to accomplish. On the other side, if I want to shoot a portrait of light at three feet and then shoot infinity, I'm going to be cranking on this thing for a couple different turns, right? So it's a little bit slower, but for people who are using it for incredibly minute, fine grain control focus, can't beat that helical. They also, in my opinion, have the best view camera integration. Cambo also integrates with view cameras, and I'll let Blake speak to that one, it's his section. But in my personal opinion, the technical camera integration to view cameras, uh, the integration between view cameras and tech cameras is best amongst the Argus Swiss line. More intercompatibility, more functionality shared. The cons are, if I give this camera to somebody who's never used a tech camera before and don't give them any instruction, they may not be able to figure out how to frame, focus, and take a picture. It is not intuitive or fast to learn. This is a tool that you must specifically be taught and specifically learn. Who has one of these? Anybody in the room? Do you agree that it is not a pick up, use the first hour kind of camera? No. Yeah. Easy. Easy. Well, you are a professional right now. Uh, that's not to say it's rocket science. In fact, I've never yet had someone buy these who didn't end up learning how to use it to its most, but it's going to be hours worth of shooting, not five minutes later you basically understand every feature and function how to use it. It's also a more expensive body because more is built into the body. On smaller lens kits like a one lens kit or a two lens kit system, that's really going to add up on the more expensive body. There's also, and you're going to think I'm joking, there is no Arca Swiss website. There is an ArcaSwiss.de that is a German distributor who's like Digital Transitions. We sell Arca Swiss, we love Arca Swiss, we live and breathe Arca Swiss. We are not Arca Swiss, neither are they. There is no Arca Swiss website. This used to be really funny because I started this 12 years ago and so I'd say, it's 2005. They don't have a website. It's now 2019, they, they still don't have a website. <laughs> Uh, that's not a big deal, in my opinion, highly biased opinion, that that's not a big deal for our clients, Digital Transitions, because we have multiple people who know the system inside and out and can answer any of your questions. But it is clearly a con. Uh, and you can do tilt, or you can rotate this panel 90 degrees and do swing, but you can't do both simultaneously on the same specific image. I can shoot a tilted image, I can rotate it, shoot a swung image, not both at the same time. That brings us to Canva. Blake, what do you think are some of the biggest advantages of your system? And keep in mind, these are just a couple of the things, right? We're forcing him to focus on a few things. Yes, of course. Um, and I want to preface all this by saying that, uh, as Doug has mentioned throughout the presentation, nobody is making a bad camera these days. Um, I just happen to At be here. At least in this world. <laughs> I just happen to be here uh, representing Cambo because I, I think they're a little bit on the better side of things. Um, so a couple of the key features comparing to some of the options that are available right now um, is the ability to perform both tilts and swings in the same unit. Um, the way that Cambo designs their lens panels um, integrate the tilt and the swing into the lens as an optional process. If you don't need to utilize all of those movements, you can actually get a lens panel that doesn't have those movements. Because of the tilts and swings on the lens panel means that as you go through the various Cambo camera options in our wide technical cam options, uh, you can still keep those same movements sort of across the way. Um, speaking of movements, uh, I'm holding one of our older anniversary editions of this camera. Um, we actually started making these 51 years ago and have since migrated to a couple of different options. But the largest of which currently available is my White RS 5000, which has a full 23 millimeters of movement in both rise fall and lateral shift. So when you are using, if this is your first time at the rodeo, that's a lot of movement. So when you're using these Rodenstock HR optics, some of which have very, very, very large image circles, uh, going back to the example earlier, that gives you a lot of room to move around that image circle to capture the viewpoint that you wish to have in this case. Um, also, of course, you can't beat something that is very well designed, very ergonomic, and uh, 
What's there meat to begin with as well? Yeah. Hey, look, does the camera take better pictures and it looks nice? No. But if you're going to own it anyway, it's nice that it kind of catches your eye and tickles your fancy. So, you know, every pros has some cons as well. Um, the major con, if you want to call it that, on the lens side of things, is that we maintain a standard helical focus. Uh, using the example earlier, it's a lot easier on our end to go from a closer focus image to a more infinity without having to crank and crank and crank and, crank and go from there. Depending on your workflow, depends on how much of a con that really works out to be. Uh, I find people tend to self-sort pretty well. They will come up, they will do this to helical, and they'll either have one of two very distinct reactions. Wow, that's incredible, I can't live with anything else. Or, wow, that's really slow. Why would I want that? If I'm in my view, it just goes as fast to use the, the other cube. Yep, neither is right or wrong. It's just different, it's all personal preference. Uh, the other sort of category that can fall into the con sphere is that because our tilt units are built onto the lens panels themselves, certain lenses, due to their design, just are not able to have those movements. Uh, case in point, we pointed at the upcoming 138 that's here. Uh, because of how long that lens is and its floating elements, tilt is not going to be something that we would be looking at. Um, again, looking at like the, the 23 HR, for example, it's not going to have it as well. But for the most part, we've got that covered. Yeah. And I would say out of lengths, out of 10 lenses we saw in a Cambo, nine of them are focal lengths that have tilt swing in them. Yeah, eight. Eight. No, now eight the 138 left side, yeah. yeah. So overwhelmingly, most of them have tilt swing available, but a couple of them do not. In contrast, the arc works in the body, so any of the lenses do have. Yeah. Moving on to the XT. The XT is now a totally new platform. Put them back down. Oh, we put it back down? Yep. Okay, great. The Phase 1 XT, uh, its main raison d'etre, really fancy, I think it means the reason they made it, is that it is simpler to use and is more integrated. If you want to take a picture, there's a big blue shutter release. You push the button, it takes a picture. The movements are recorded in the metadata, encoded into the RAW file for automatic lens correction, automatic selection of the ideal LCC from your library. It's easier, there are fewer steps, it's more integrated, it is just more like a standard camera that still has movement, right? So we haven't given up the technical part of technical camera, but we've taken away the technical part of using it, right? It's easier and faster to use. If you've never used a tech camera before, that's probably gonna matter to you more than if you've been using one for years, right? Uh, next is form factor. They went to great lengths, they call us a field camera because they looked for every place they could shed one ounce. And they got a camera that is pretty darn small light for what it is, right? This is not an iPhone in size, it's not a, Sony RX100 in size, it's a totally different kind of camera, but for the kind of camera this is, it is very small, it's very light, and form factor-wise, I think it's actually very well designed. It also, if I'm a tripod, rotates from horizontal to vertical, and locks. And rotates back to horizontal, and locks. So switching from a horizontal composition to a vertical composition doesn't require removing the camera, doesn't require a separate L-bracket, doesn't require anything, and you notice the dovetail at the bottom is an Arca Swiss compatible dovetail, which is also true on both the Arca and Campbell lines. But the point is, you don't end up with this, I'm using a Sony R whatever with a L bracket with a separate plate for this head, and I swap it back and forth. And, you know, it's very elegant to use this in a tripod based scenario. Also, this can slide all the way around. There is one screw back here. This corner slides off, and the entire foot comes right off. So if you're shooting it handheld for an extended period of time, you can even shed this, I don't have the, the weight off hand. It's not a lot of weight that you're shedding. You're making it a little bit more ergonomic and you're shedding a little bit of weight, but that weight is something they care about. Field camera, small, light, form factor. It's their big claim to fame. Another thing here is the shutter. This is a Phase 1X shutter. It was announced alongside the Phase 1XT body. It sinks at 1,000th of a second it gets its power from the digital back itself. There's no cabling because it's communicating to the digital back through pins on the body. And there's no separate controller because the phase one digital back interface is what you use to change the aperture and the shutter and the trigger. 
So in contrast to some other solutions that have some form of electronic shutter on a tech camera, this is just way more innovative. Cons, the biggest and most obvious one is movement range. In order to get a smaller, lighter field camera that is easier to use, they compromise on the absolute range of movement. Blake, your 5,000 goes how much up, left, right, and down? Uh, so it's 23 in, in either direction. For a total of 46 of range, this has a total of 20, oh my gosh. I just had a four month old. 12 and 12. Thank you, 24 millimeters, because I can't add in my head. Uh, I have a very young baby, sleep is not a thing for me right now. Although the last week's been pretty good. Anyway, you have how much? 46. And we have 24 on this one, right? Now, does that matter to you? That is a question for you, and we're obviously, obviously very glad to help consult with you and help you understand where you might use that room or not. If you are looking for 46 millimeters movement, this is not the body for you. If you are looking for smaller, lighter, more integrated, it might be, and you might be okay with that change in range of movement. With the 23 and 32 lens, this range of movement is more or less all you could have used anyway, but there are lenses like the 90 HRSW where you could have used more than this body provides. So that is a con. The other con is that currently the XT lenses themselves do not offer tilt. Maybe phase one will come to the market with something to address that in the future. I'm not saying that as in maybe you ain't quitting. I mean, maybe, maybe they won't, I don't know. Uh, but for right now, the lenses you can buy that are native lenses, there is no tilt. Now, very interestingly, I'm going to remove this lens panel. I'm building up some tension and suspense. I'm gonna put the native XT lens with the native X shutter down. I'm gonna take this lens off this cambo body. What's going on? And I'm gonna put this cambo tilt swing module, upside down. I'm gonna put this cambo tilt swing model right on the XT. It's a lot easier when you're looking So when you have the wand in front of you. There we go. So with the Cambo TS lens panel on there, of course we do have the same tilt that you would find on a Cambo body. In this configuration, you don't get all of the integration. You don't get that X shutter that sinks at 1 1,000th. You can't control the aperture from back here because of course the aperture is now manual, but you can still use it. So you can use this very similarly to the way that you'd use a Cambo with tilt today, but if you want all the upgraded improvement workflow-wise, there's no tilt today. So that is a con. So as we see here, with the launch of the Phase 1 XT, we have a third option that we can offer. I think it'll be the right answer for a lot of people, especially people who have not used tentative cameras before or tried them but found them a little too cumbersome or slow for their specific personal needs or preferences. There will still be many people for whom we think the right answer is a Cambo or an Arca Swiss or heck, because of course it's your money, not ours. All three of them, I don't care. Works for me. <laughs> anyway, all three offer some unique pros, all of them offer some unique cons. Now, let's talk about some accessories. On the Phase 1 XT side, you can accept a variety of different lens panels. If you're considering an XT, one thing you might consider are some of these non XT lenses. That includes Canon lenses. Grips. You see here the stock default Phase 1 provided handle is black. You may absolutely love that. You may absolutely hate it. There's no right or wrong here. It's totally aesthetics and personal preference. DT is glad to be the only one providing right now a rosewood handle compatible with the Phase 1 XT. You can swap it out, include it in your order. You can make your XT rosewood. I'm a little biased. I love it. But then again, I was the one who decided we would do it. So of course I love it. <laughs> you can also do shades. Shades on the back. This is a Phase 1. This is a DT LCD shade for Phase 1 digital backs. It's not exclusively for the XT, it would work just as well on a view camera or a tech camera from Marcus Swiss or Cambo. It also works on the Phase 1 XF with the waist level viewfinder. It provides nice shading. You can see there, it does not block any button or any port on the system. And it is available from DT on our website for $229. $229. If you got cash, I bet Lance will take your cash right now. <laughs> Next. You can also do a shade on the front. 
I shave. Here I'm keeping the number of tabs reduced. We made a compendium lens shave, right? Compendium lens shaves move and hold their position. So as you're doing rise or fall or shift left and right, you can position the compendium to block the light for the specific frame. You look in live view, you can move it until you see it and then pull it back a little bit. You can look at the lens to see if there's a speck or highlight and pull it in or out until you block that specific highlight. If you're used to standard SLR lens shades, this thing kicks their ass. Much more likely to block the flare and is compatible with rise, fall, shift. This design of the Phase 1 XT that allows you to put the compendium shade here may be perfectly fine for some. However, I thought it was not a great place for it. Next screen. It blocks easy access to the shutter release. It blocks your hand from reaching the rise fall easily. You can certainly still reach that one and tell you it's not usable, but I found it impinging on the ergonomics and it blocks easy access uh, to accessing the lens from the top. Also, if you rotate this camera and you're using the traditional mount point, the shade is going to rotate with it. So if you've arranged it to look up, it will now be looking to the left. Not a big deal, you can grab it and push it, right? But DT exclusively provides the DT Dovetail Compendium Mount Alternative for the XT. It looks almost identical to this one, except it's a little bit taller. It's got the holes for the compendium built in. So it still functions as a compendium. You put it straight on top of the tripod head, but now the compendium's held from underneath, where it doesn't block the handle, doesn't block the lens, doesn't block the rise, fall, and shift release. Not rocket science, but it's a really nice touch, and hopefully, since I was a product manager, so we should do one of these, you enjoy it. Next. Finally, tripod heads. This is where I'm gonna to try to show some independence here. Handle makes some tripod heads. They may be right for you. You should consider them. They make high quality precision stuff. My personal preference is for Arca Swiss heads, specifically two of them, the Arca Swiss Cube and the L60 Level. The Arca Swiss Cube is unique in that it offers the option to look straight up or down. Right? You're doing an architectural shot of a stairwell, you are shooting sky or up into a large soyuz tree. Looking upward into a big tree, <laughs> you can point the camera straight up or down using an Arca Swiss Cube plus rotation. However, it's big and heavy. It's also expensive, but you know it's really, really good, so it makes sense that it's expensive. But it's big and it's heavy. And if you're pairing it with the Phase 1 XT especially, or one of the smaller tech cameras from Cambo or Arca, for example, Cambo makes the RC400 that is small and light, or smaller and lighter than their already reasonably small and light tech cameras. Arca Swiss makes a Fact Dumb, which is also small and light. If you're using a small and light tech camera and then a big, heavy head, I think you're barking up the wrong tree. And unless you absolutely need that ability to look straight up or down, I suggest the Arca Swiss L60 level. You can see here, it still has this in radial movements for both axes. It still has both bottom and top rotation. We have it mounted underneath the RS1600 that's on the camera stand, the Cambo camera stand, I should mention. Uh, and uh, I really, really like that head. Heads are very personal, but this is my favorite. So, we have taken you through the history of all photography as it relates to view cameras. Yeah. We're taking a look at the capabilities that view cameras, tech cameras, and film cameras offer, what the heck those terms mean. We've compared a couple different makes of tech cameras. Each of those cameras are made, each of those brands make several iterations. We have several of them here. We have a lot more information on our website and up in our heads. And we have accessories for specifically the Phase 1 XT that DT is exclusively making and providing to our clients. We had a question. We had, right, so let me get to that in just a second. Next. There should be one more slide that says Q&A. So first, I'd like some comments. Lance? First, we have in the audience Dr. DiBernardo, who uh, uses the Cambo and the IQ4150, and uh, he had volunteered to share a few words. Please, with his experience. Aaron, altar call. 
Okay. <laughs> Where, who's the who's doing the church the church key? Yeah, that was that was me. <laughs> Harry, what do you have? What do you use it for? What do you like about it? What do you not like about it? I have the um, well, the phase one camera, but we talked about the. Uh, you use the anniversary, anniversary edition. So I have the Cambo anniversary edition. Uh, so yes. this one right here. The newer one. Oh, the sixteen hundred. Sixteen hundred. So the 1600, and it has the uh, 32 and 90 millimeter lens, and then I use it with the uh, G4, and um, I use that for I I use that for um, lots of landscape photography. That I've used it all over the world. Um, I like that it's nice and small. And I, years ago, before you were born, I used a big one view camera, and um, that was great. But um, now it's really much smaller. I can carry it all in a small bag. I can hike with it, and um, we we took it to uh, and and one of one of the most important things was I used to do large black and white landscape photography, and um, I basically didn't do it for many years, maybe twenty years, because the quality wasn't high enough when we went to digital. And then once the I G four uh, was available, um, it was pretty much far surpassed, surpassed everything I could do. The printer technology came up to speed also. And uh, last year we did um, a spring and then winter Yosemite. And uh, when I was in the Ansel Adams gallery, they were like, oh, I don't know where that, <laughs> how to bring it into the gallery. And they want the photos to uh, go to the Ansel Adams gallery soon. So the, the, the images are superior. Um, and, and it does have the tilt swing. Um, how many millimeters do we get out of this? Uh, we're at uh, a little bit shy of 20 on both so sides. It's, so it's 20 in each direction. There's a big um, field of view on the lenses. So um, that I carry it in a little bag about this big with, with the, um, the head, the lenses, the back. It, it's about this big, small backpack, easy to move along and get stunning photography. And that's what I use with this, with the the uh, XF um, phase one, I'll use that for uh, clinical photography. We do a lot of studies and research on the skin and lasers and things like that. So we use that for clinical. So that's what I do with all this. Well, thank you for sharing your experience, Barry. Thank you very much. Thanks. Do you currently own a phase one product? Please raise your hand. We are obviously very biased. We like to try to provide technically accurate, real world based information. But we also sell these things, so by all means, at an event like this, grab one of the other people who owns a phase one and say, what do you actually think? Maybe give them an extra beer and get that extra information from them. I did not. So, visualizer. I can do that. I can drive one even while I'm talking. Yes, you want to push escape first to get out of the situation. So, DT does make a, and we're coming to the last five minutes, so if you're thinking about your next beer, we're very close. Uh, at dtcommercialphoto.com, you can go to the support section and go to visualizer, and it will show you the relative size of different lens image servals, the relative size of different image sensors, small format, crop, medium format, full frame, medium format. It will allow you to see how much movement you will get, how much stitching you can do, and how much you can displace the horizon. If it finds you, if you find it confusing, just talk to us about it, because we made the darn thing, right? And we can walk you through, oh, I'm thinking about getting a wide and normal and a long lens, but I'm not sure which one. We can help you with those choices, right? I will now give you the elevator pitch, because we all have you trapped and you can't leave, including you on the internet, you can't leave. Um, I'm looking at you. You're about to close the window. Don't do it. Now, uh, the elevator pitch for DT, we have two offices in New York City and in LA. We have 25 employees. We focus exclusively on products that we can learn a lot about, that we feel that we can provide service and support that exceeds anybody else's on, and that we believe is the best of that product category. We do not sell 15 different camera brands. We sell phase one. We don't sell 28 different tech camera brands. We sell Cambo, Arca Swiss, and now phase one XT. We don't sell 100 different lighting brands. We sell Bron Color and Pro Photo. We know those products inside and out. We don't have boxes and glass shelves and a high schooler working at the cash register. We work off of expert consultation, working with you to pick out, to consider, research, test, 
and decide on a camera. We have a lot of clients in this room ask their opinion of what we've done for them, uh, for what we've been able to provide them as far as services and support, and hopefully they'll have nice things to say. Um, that's TT. That was Campbell USA. Please, lots of beer and questions. Questions, questions, question here in the front. Yeah, can you show some sample image from Lightroom? I can't because we hate Lightroom. No, I'm kidding. Um, ah, I'm sure will. Uh, yeah. Lightroom is fine. Lightroom is fine. Yeah. Don't you know, sue me. Lightroom is fine. Uh, capture One does get the most out of these images. We I have think, I think something one, like 300 <laughs> gigabytes of labeled, categorized, organized, labeled, raw samples that we have shot in-house or that have been provided to us from clients for the purpose of showing. I'm not going to go through those right now with you. We can pull us aside and we'll take you through them all on the computers, or we can send you raw files via the magic of the internet. And that goes to you as a wall. We have a native print off of an IQ4150. Yeah, one single frame. One single frame. One of our clients, Rudy Italia, uh, when we first took delivery of it, that was basing at it to bring the sky up a little. And we had it printed. That's like five foot by six foot. And that's natively without any upresing up out of the file. So you can take a look at the detail on that image. And again, we're very glad to provide you raw files from whatever back, plus whatever lens, plus whatever scenario. So you can do that inside, right? Sorry? You can do that inside. You want to talk to us. Yeah, so on the website, we, for, for both pure selfish reasons and also deep technical reasons, we can't put 300 gigabytes of raw files on our website for anybody anywhere in the world to download freely. Mm -hmm. However, we are not shy about <laughs> sharing them. Contact us, tell us what you're interested in, we'll be glad to share. Okay. Next question. Uh, sorry. First on oh, oh, that um, shade for the back. Is yes. That, is that magnetic? How, how is that? It is actually precisely made to slide on and stay by friction. Friction fit. It is a friction fit on the curvature of the back panel of the LCD. I think it's really stellar, but you have one of those and you have a whole bunch of digital backs sitting here. Walk up and put it on and see what you think. It fits on the front in order to block glare. It reverses and fits back on for storage so it doesn't take up extra space in your pack. It doesn't block any ports when it's in the normal viewing configuration and in the reverse position, it does not touch the lock release, which would be a major concern if you design it to miss that. And the battery is still IQ3. Work. Battery yeah. may still work, sync cable still works. IQ3, IQ3. Any IQ digital back. It does, we should put this in the website, it does technically kind of work on the old Credos, but not perfect. It's designed for the IQ. It works perfectly on any IQ. Barry? It's not a question, it's another comment, and that was before I got all that stuff, I worked with Lamp for what a year and rented a lot of it. And you know, you just don't go buy this. We we rented for many times and then um, very, very. If someone wants to just buy it, they can't. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we very rarely have someone walk in the door, credit card in hand, and say, I want this SKU, this SKU, and this SKU. We'll say yes, that's no problem, but that's not what we do, right? We sit down with you, we walk you through, we help you test. So we get the right thing. Get the right thing. Thank you for saying that. Other questions? From the internet, any questions? Internet? Internets are watching your hands. Why don't you use my Mac? Please. Um, do you sell printers as well? And follow up, what kind of printers are We that? don't sell printers. Mm -hmm. That was actually printed at one of our good friends at Blazing Editions, um, based in Rhode Island. They do a lot of sublimation printing to metal, so the metal prints you see around the office here, uh, in, the, in the conference room and in the reception area, were produced by them. They also do fine art paper prints as well, and they do a great job. Yeah, but we, that's, part of our, that's part of our hyper focus. Output is super duper important. Most people buying one of these, output is a huge component of why, but we are not experts on output and we don't pretend to be. We are experts on a very narrow range of things. I'll tell you, I do what you do black and white. Well, how do I buy things? I went to a course with professional printers in the industry and uh, sat there for two days and at the end of all that, the answer was uh, Canon Pro Series size of 2000, and it, it's exceptional. You black and white. It's black and white, color, and it, and it's just so smart, and 12 inks, and it, it is just superb, and 
we don't waste a lot of rolls or, or prints. Um. Back in the day, we used to be able to take like a six color Epson and put in six shades of black. Oh, yes, yeah. You can still do that. Yeah, you can still do that. You can still do that, but it's not as necessary. This thing well, you said it very well. So friends, without any further questions, we'll end the pre oh, you have a question? You don't have a question, you're pointing yourself. Uh, we have an announcement for Lance. Just before we end, um, for Photo Plus that's coming up next month, we are gonna have a booth at the show, but also during Thursday and Friday with the um, schedules on our website, we'll be doing some presentations here uh, that are specialized, and one being uh, with Adam Elstein, talking about tech camera workflows from an end user's perspective. He's a fine art photographer and an architectural photographer, so he'll have a lot of knowledge to share. We'll have Martin Axon, who's a master printmaker, talking about oh, alternative awesome. print methods, uh, such photo as photo platinum and palladium photo. he specializes in, and along with how we scan the film with our film scanning system. Then we have uh, Keith Majors, I believe, right? Yes. Keith Majors will be talking about fashion, and uh, people photography, and you know how he's used phase has helped him in that. And um, we have one other one. Yeah, lots of presentations. Take a look at the website. Right. Definitely worth your time. With that, we will end the presentation part tonight. But please find other people who need your services or want your services, and mingle and mix. And we need to give something away. Yep, two right? things away. So we have a random number generator. An XP. <laughs> and she is not one of those items. Oh, oh. We need a maximum number of cake. Yes, yeah, so we are giving away two style packs to the 23 people here tonight. 23. This is our back end system that you were all registered in. Did anyone not register? I wasn't on there. You weren't on there? Yeah, well, I'm just on there. What number are you? I'm just going to call you 24, okay? You're 24. You are 24. Right? And then so, out of 24 numbers, <laughs> three, two, one, number four. Number four is Kyle Nodal. Kyle! Kyle! Kyle. Kyle. I will send you an email. Okay. And, number and the two. second winner is number 11, which is Peter Jabuski. Hey! Woo! Yeah. Peter! Okay, Next one mingle, one. drink, be merry. Good night for now. Yeah, we're a valve here. Yes, so is it the one There's a little bit of backlash whereby I get my hand off it, and I may have had the orange flash in the box, and then I did it, which makes me wonder, which is too far off. So that tension, the tension gets adjusted. You will still find